Hey, welcome to the Ron Johnson D- Discipleship Podcast, where we make it our point every week to connect the dots about what's going on in our larger culture with how that squares with the Word of God and what it means to be disciples and what it means for the church to be a disciple-making uh, institution. And, you know, we, we're, we're doing this uh, podcast this morning on Wednesday, so this is post-election. We did that intentionally because yeah. we wanted to be relevant. <laughs> and guess what? We got nothing to say uh, in yeah. terms of anything consequential. Yeah. Um, and so as you're watching this Thursday, uh, we're not sure if the, how long this is going to... You guys might have a little more insight than we have at the moment, so at we're the speaking moment. to the future. But, but, we, but both of our eyes are looking a little heavy this morning yeah. because uh, you didn't sleep much. I didn't sleep much. I was trying to stay up today, stay up late to see the results come in. They were counting the votes, and at some point they were just like, yeah, we're done for the night. I'm like, all right, I guess we're not getting any more counts. And I so. can see the handwriting on the wall. And that we weren't going to have anything conclusive, so I went to bed. But I went to bed late because I appreciated my both my sons were very much engaged, which yeah. I'm glad, uh, following things and concerned with uh, uh, you know where things were going and as a nation. And so we had some very good discussions and, and talking about how we thought things were going to pan out. But yeah. but I think we're both concerned about the fact that we have an election day that now could drag on for weeks or even, uh, you know, months, depending on um, what happens, which is not really the way it's supposed to no, be. No, and especially if it gets dragged on to court cases, yeah. Supreme Court, all these different things, you know. I mean, I, I want the truth to come out. Don't get me wrong. I want the, the true winner to emerge. But like you said, dragging it out for yeah. days and days and days is not great for our democratic so, so, process. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, what a prophetic picture of where we are as a nation we really are, you know, still hanging in the balance here <laughs> on a national election. We're, yeah. we're a nation very much divided. And if you've been following the series that, that I've been doing for uh, uh, on an, an, an Unalienable, um, a lot of uh, the thought for that has come out of the excellent work by Oz Guinness. And Oz Guinness talks about how America right now is, is a nation divided on two revolutions. We have the, the American Revolution and we have the French Revolution. Mm. The American Revolution rooted in the principles from God's Word. The French Revolution, which was really a God-hating revolution that was uh, based on a whole other set of ideals. And that's really the two groups we have right now, you know, fighting for the soul of America. Are we going to conserve the amazing foundation and the great principles that we've had as a nation? Are we going to burn it all to the ground and uh, pursue a whole new progressive way of, you know, understanding government and equality and uh, these types of issues. So uh, I, I just think it's, we're, we're literally seeing that the battle for the heart and soul of this nation played out in, in politics, you know. Yeah. That's uh, so let's talk about what we do know. Uh, what we do know is the Senate's not going to change, the, at least the makeup of the Senate. Yeah. Um, By and large, it seems like the Republicans are uh, still going to hold on to uh, leadership in the Senate. Mitch McConnell uh, won his re- re-election, yep. so he's going to continue to become uh, the chairman of the Senate. And there still uh, is going to be a confirmed majority uh, of Democrat leadership in the House, but but Republicans did gain some seats. Did gain some seats as far as we saw last. Um, so, And then obviously the presidency is still up in the air, and... Uh, We'll and, see what happens. Yeah, and part of our frustration, again, was last night in certain areas, critical states like Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. where the president had a growing commanding lead, uh, and then all of a sudden everybody decides they're going to stop counting votes, and then sometimes we wake up in the morning and all of a sudden uh, things have flip-flopped. And, uh, and so there's obviously some concern about uh, the integrity of what's going sure. on, and hope all that will be. Well, I'm trusting that our leadership... Uh, have uh, foresight to see what's going on, and there's enough integrity in our country to make sure that um, everything's yeah. done in a truthful way and manner. And we'll keep praying. And I want to encourage you guys to continue to pray. Yeah. The, the battle is not over. The, this warfare is continuing, yeah. and the, the stakes are higher than ever. So let's continue to pray for yeah. our just country. Yeah, take a little pause here. I, I want to thank everybody that came out on uh, our pre-election 
prayer meeting, uh, man, our sanctuary was full. There yeah. was so much energy and passion, uh, and I felt like it was a powerful night. It just reminds us that the Lord is in charge of America and the nations of the world, uh, that we are the apple of his eye, God's heart for his church. None of that's changed. Elections don't change that. Uh, and that uh, it just kind of reminds us again of the work you know, that's before us. And so, yeah. as you said, let's keep praying this through. Pray for righteousness to be established. Pray for uh, wickedness to be exposed. Pray that any kind of corruption or, or anybody with evil agendas, that that would be clearly exposed and that um, God's righteousness and justice would, you know, would prevail. Amen. Um, but, you know, we're not here tonight. You, if you were up watching all the talking heads and the prognosticators, yeah, you, you, <laughs> you got enough of that, and that, that's not our job yeah. to, to We're read. not breaking down the counties <laughs> no. and, the, and the data and all that stuff. I no, so our our, our uh, purpose of this podcast is this, is to really ask the question that I think my son was, was framing for me last night. It was such a, I thought it was such a, a powerful moment, one that I'll certainly uh, not soon forget. He was sitting at the foot of our bed. I was already in bed, and and we were just talking about what's what's going on, what's at stake, how this thing is gonna gonna pan out. And and as a 20, 20 some year old, uh, he said to me, Dad, you know, I'm asking, what is my role? You know, what what does God want me to do? And I told him, I said, you know what? I said that's a that's a Number one, it's overwhelming, and maybe if you're watching, you're going, you know, what is the church to do? I, I think of that passage of Scripture that says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yep. And so here's a young man who's, you know, looking at moving into marriage, raising a family, loves the Lord, and uh, and yet there's obviously many, many things in this country that are deeply, deeply concerning. Yep. Uh, and he's asking the right question, though. Absolutely. What do I do? You know, I, you know, for me, I, I have... Young, young children. I have, you know, so say all all the people I want win this election. Landslide, best case scenario. Four years later, we're back to the same questions. Yeah, right? same fights. If I'm thinking four years, my son is going to be 10. <laughs> same issue, same battle, same fight. And I, I my kind of takeaway, I look at all of this, is, you know, I shared with, with you earlier, is like I see there's one direction for most of our states. They are turning blue. Okay, in general. Okay. It's slow. And when we slow. talk about that, kind of a slow move towards... Towards secularism, towards more progressive thought. Um, it's a moving away from our, our biblical foundation, our Judeo-Christian heritage. Absolutely. And, and yeah, every once in a while you have some, uh, some states who maybe come back a little bit when you have an anomaly like Donald Trump. But, but in, in most cases, there's a trending, there's a reliable trend in one direction. And, and let me just say too, you know, historically speaking, yeah, that is why God sends revival, because the church is falling asleep, yeah. and we're losing the culture. So we this, this is not a new right. s- scenario for right. us. We we've seen times in American history when things have grown really really dark, and where uh, the cultural decay has been pronounced. But praise God, that's when the Lord Himself steps in for the sake of His glory and for the sake of the church and for the sake of His His mercy for people. Right. And and God has sent revival, and so you know this is nothing new. But you're hitting something that's exactly right. There's a there's a gradual erosion and a drifting yeah. towards uh, secularism. So and, and you know as you know, I still consider myself relatively young. I plan to live for several yeah, more decades. I consider myself there relatively young. We're young. both relatively young, <laughs> and we have many more decades to live and kids to raise and grandkids to enjoy. Amen. Amen. And. I asked the same question to your son. You know, I'm a couple de- decades older than him, yeah. but what are we to do? And what do we do for our kids? Yeah. And, and I, I want to just back up. Yeah. First of all, these are great questions. And a lot of people, when things are great, they never ask really important questions. Yeah. And I shared Sunday, you know, controversy is, is our friend. Yes. Uh, because controversy forces you. It draws a line, and it forces you to decide where you stand on issues of great importance. And so... These are sobering questions. It's like, how? what is my role as a Christian and as a patriot, as a lover of this nation, and as a lover of Christ and a lover of his church, what is my unique role to stem this, you know, progressive tide that seems to be rising? Well, secularism, that's, that's, that's just kind of yeah. washing over everything. And I was watching, um, like, a conservative news network last night, and they mentioned there's three institutions— that right now is 
uh, basically the instigator or, or Right. Then yeah. it becomes so progressive, so secularized yeah. that, that they're really dangerous to, yeah. to, to, to our folks. And, and as I folks. mentioned that you guys will recognize them, the first one is higher education. Yep. By and large, like 99.9% .9 of higher education is a place for brooding secularism. Yeah. Now let's yeah. just pause there. You know, yeah. the, the irony of it is yeah. our local state governments are taking our tax dollars yeah. and using some of that money to fund higher education. Yeah. And the very places we're funding have become these poisonous cauldrons of ideas and thoughts that are anti-American and that are poisoning the minds of our, our young people and really raising up a whole group of, of, of radicals who don't love America, who think America is wicked and who are really look, looking to burn the whole system down. Now, that, that's public higher education. Yeah. It's very godless, very secularized, and uh, and is actually uh, you know working incredibly against us and has become, like you said, a stronghold. So much so that, that to be a conservative uh, professor, uh, a thought leader in a state university is almost impossible Anomalies. these days. Yeah. 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 So you got higher education, you have uh, the media, sure. uh, they call it uh, traditional media, uh, mainstream media. And, and let's just pause there. Yeah. President Trump has had to fight against mainstream media for four years. Imagine if you were a candidate you know, mo mostly your opposition has to buy media time, it costs a ton of money yeah. uh, to, to create negative ads against you. I mean, we see this during election seasons. President Trump has had to endure four years of incredibly biased, hateful, anti-Trump messaging that has come, uh, again, uh, at, at the expense of mainstream media. So they're not having to buy ads. This is just the <laughs> nonstop... Yeah. And that has a way of working on the on the national psyche. Not to mention, the media was predicting a landslide for Joe Biden. The polls, yeah. and the media was trumpeting all this. You know, I think they said in one of the states there was a uh, uh, Biden was supposed to win it by seventeen percent, and Trump was actually ahead last night in that. Right, state. and it, like I think the odds they gave him right now is about fifty fifty. Okay, as we can see even now, it's, it's close. Yeah, and regardless of who who ends up winning. One of the polls or the odds was one to ten, that that Trump has one intention one to win. Chance. chance to win. So again, I mean, this is to me again. The media is no longer reporting news; they are shaping news. Yeah, I, I said in one of my tweets that the media has become propaganda outlets. Uh, they 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 get to choose what they're going to talk about. They get yeah. to choose what they're not going to talk about. Uh, and then all of them are in lockstep. I mean, they, uh, they just keep saying the same things over and over again, and they keep ignoring issues of great importance. Uh, and, and I think the media understands something that many Christians don't understand is the power of words. Yeah. So you keep speaking something over, you, and, over, and, over and over again. Yeah. It's going to take root somewhere. Well, it eventually becomes truth with a yeah. little t. It yes. becomes the cultural's truth. It becomes cult. Yeah, exactly. And they know how to shape it. And and we need to understand that. And we need to make sure that we uh, adapt accordingly and yeah. not just take everything we hear as the truth just because it's from a television. Right. So this but, but, election but, should teach so, us that. But when you look at, at public higher education, number one, yeah. and now you said the media, media, number two, these are two huge idea-shaping institutions. Yeah. And then the third one. The third one is entertainment. You can talk about sports. You can talk about you know, music, Hollywood, Hollywood and all that stuff. And these are three huge pillars that is basically uh, the the bastions of secularism. That's kind of just, I mean, I, I was watching, I want to give them credit, I was watching the, the Daily Wire TV network, what live stream they had with Ben Shapiro and those guys. And I mean, their whole idea is those, those three pillars uh, cannot be reformed, they need to be replaced. Yeah. And uh, it was an interesting idea what that, I mean, I'm, I'm not going into details about it. But, but again, these are the forces that's, that's, that's trending and moving and shaking our nations. Yeah. So the question again, and, and this podcast is not meant to be a debilitating or a right. discouraging because there is hope and there there is action step. So I guess the question is, what do we do as a church? Yeah. What do we do? Well, and, and I appreciate on this. You and I talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, these types of questions mm -hmm. are questions that we should be wrestling with in the local church. Yeah. If you're a kingdom church, if you're a salvation church yeah. only, you're not even talking about these things. And, and I think this is... This is where we're, we're both in agreement. And Living Stones, we should be shaping thought. We should be figuring out what are the solutions to deal with 
uh, you know, state run and uh, public institutions that are poisoning our nation with the media. How do we counteract the media? Uh, that these are issues that are local church issues. These are these are issues the body of Christ should be wrestling with. The other one I'm going to bring up is, you know, have you all seen those maps of America when they show how people voted by county? America is a, a blanket of red, which means that for the most part, we have conservative values. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, values that, that many times are Christian uh, uh, values. And then you look at these certain areas where are urban areas, yeah. you know, uh, like like Indiana could be all red and then there's a pocket up in where we live that's that might be blue or there might be a sometimes depending on the race, a, a blue pocket in Indianapolis. You look at Illinois. Illinois is not this liberal bastion. It, Illinois is controlled largely by Chicago politics. And you look at these urban areas where where uh, they, they've just become strongholds for what I would call the French Revolution ideology as opposed to the American Revolution. And, um, and, and the issue is, what does the church do to begin to disciple those cities? You know, we get back to the, to the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not about leading people to Jesus. The Great Commission is about, I lead you to Christ, I teach you to obey in all things, including government, and then you go and teach somebody else. And, and the ultimate the challenge, though, that the Lord gave us in Matthew 28 was to disciple entire nations. Now, again, that's a kingdom mentality. That's not a local church salvation only mentality. Yeah. So we've got to be asking, what are we doing to reach in our area? What, we, what am I doing to reach Northwest Indiana and Chicago with the gospel so that those ideas about government and everything else come under the obedience to Christ. And, and this topic about the gospel of the kingdom versus the gospel of just evangelism has been burning my heart for uh, a couple weeks now. Um, yeah. But the Lord's been percolating in my heart because Jesus rarely talked about uh, conversion. Uh, he talks about the kingdom a lot. He doesn't talk about evangelism that much, but he talks about making disciples. Right. He Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. He preached the, the gospel of the kingdom. And and, you, and most, I've never really heard of that until like when I came out to our culture here, the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. No one's really articulated what that means. We feel like the, king, the, the Christian work should happen on, on Sundays. That's where ministry happens. And the church's job really is to prepare you for eternity only. Now, right. we would say, yes, that is the most That's important. Part of it, yeah. we, we need to be prepared for eternity. But this is what I was sharing with my son. You know, why is it that we've somehow lost the fact that we're going to live, we're going to raise kids, we're going to run our businesses, you know, we're going to be involved in, in public life, that most of our life does not center around what we do just here at the local church? And, you know, I was telling my son, you, you got to be thinking about what, what is, what's the world going to look like raising your kids, sending them to public school? You know, are you going to even have the, you, you can't just withdraw from culture because guess what? Well, we're, well, we're not going to worry about public school. We're just going to homeschool our kids. Well, in many places in Europe, it's illegal to homeschool your yeah. kids. So, and, and your kids will be taken away from you. This has happened in Germany and other places. Your kids are taken away from you by the state well, if you homeschool your kids. So we can't, I guess my point is we can't just put our heads in the sea. Yeah. Well, speaking of homeschool, like, yeah, I homeschool my kids. That's a solution right now that my wife and I are able to do because of our financial situation. First of all, many families cannot do that. Right. Second of all, remember when COVID happened and many families were, were um, homeschooling their kids. I, I believe Harvard Review or, or some Harvard professor came out with some article basically attacking homeschool. Yep. It's all strategic, targeting exactly what's going on and saying, hey, they're taking people out of school and they're indoctrinating them at home. It's like, yep. wait, 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 that's what's happening in schools. We're supposed to train our kids the way we want. Yes. But, it's a, but, but homeschool itself can easily be under attack, can easily be taken right. away. So you can't just say, well, I won't worry about public school or yeah. homeschool. I won't worry about yeah. this big public issue you. I'll just retreat our churches. Let's not worry about public policy. Let's not be accused of being the, the, the government church or whatever. Right. Let, let's just keep preaching happy, clappy messages and telling yeah. people about self-esteem and, and, uh, and about the sweet by and by. Right. But the problem is eventually they're coming to you. They're coming to your church. Uh, they're coming after your liberties. And we just can't sit by uh, naively and think we can just sit this one out. You might be able to sit it out for your generation, maybe, but for my kids, for my grandkids, not gonna happen. Well, I was just talking to a brother this morning and he was just like, I can't just sit around. Yeah. 
I mean, what do we do? How do we engage? How can we, I mean, it seems so daunting because on so many levels, this is happening in Washington, D.C., uh, one of the most power-packed, but also, in my opinion, one of the most corrupt places in the history of mankind. Yeah. And it's like, what kind of impact can we have on there? So, you know, there are a couple of different things. I have a couple of different thoughts. I'll let you share, but I have to share a couple of different thoughts of action steps, okay? Yeah. Practical yeah. things we're gonna do. I wanna share this verse uh, from Matthew 16. You guys are very familiar with this verse. And I, I feel like this is something the Lord's been speaking to me of, you know, after Jesus, it's interesting because Jesus preached the message um, and, you know, and then he asked, um, he asked his uh, disciples, who do you say I am? Yep. And Peter responded and say, you know, you are the Messiah. Yep. And Jesus said, you know, he said, blessed are you because this revelation has been revealed by the Holy Spirit. Right. And that to me is basically, is, is an invitation of the conversion process, the, the, the redemption of his heart and soul and, and salvation. Then he talks about the church. He said, I'll tell you that you're Peter. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful statement if you really yep. think about it. Yep. The church of Jesus Christ cannot be overcome by even the forces of hell. Then he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now, that sounds very archaic, maybe. Uh, it sounds like it's very, I mean, I didn't understand that verse for the for the longest time. Growing up, read that verse, I'm like, okay, it's another verse. What it, yeah, what does that mean? What does that really mean? But as I meditate recently, as I meditate on this more and more, I realized, you know, the keys to, the, to God's kingdom, our job is to usher in, even the Lord's prayer, may your kingdom come and wait, may your will be done. His kingdom is what's gonna transform our culture. Okay, his kingdom, the ushering of his kingdom, of his cultures, of yep. the way he does things. It's literally his kingdom coming in that's going to affect people. And, and again, the gospel of the kingdom is what's going to transform our nation. It's not the gospel of evangelism. We have so many churches preaching the gospel of evangelism. It has zero impact, okay, in our culture at large. Right. It has impacted people personally. Personally. Uh, but a culture... Which is, again, culture, what we, you know, culture is hard to define. That's why we don't have a lot of clarity to it. But you can look at culture by saying, what do you reward? What is defended? And what is celebrated? It's a, it's a simple way to look at culture. By and large, we're not changing the culture because we're, we're ushering a gospel of evangelism and not a gospel. I, Our churches have become almost like little Christian ghettos, you know, yes. where we all have the same ideas. We all stay in the four walls, and, and the world really doesn't care about our little Christian ghetto. In no. fact, that, just stay in your four walls and believe all your crazy stuff. Like we said, it's when we take the lordship of Jesus outside of the church and we begin to say, you know, wait a minute, we're, we're going to transform public education. Right. We're going to transform government law, some of these areas that have become so hostile so, to us. So a very practical example I'll give is, no, so instead of going to a businessman, an entrepreneur, a business owner, and saying, hey, your greatest ministry, your greatest place to make an impact is when you come on Sunday and be an usher or be a life group leader on Friday night or be, and all these are good things. And these are things I encourage and I recruit for. That's part of my job. Um, and I'm grateful I, for that. And those are all good things. Or like, come and feed the poor. All those are good things. But instead of saying that's your primary way of ushering the kingdom yeah. of God, your primary way to usher in the kingdom, your, your, your true ministry of the, of the gospel of the kingdom is Monday through Friday and your everyday life and your work. Yeah. So now your impact goes from one day or one night or one morning a week yeah. to Monday through Friday in everything you do. In fact, you are a full-time missionary. Absolutely. You are a full-time minister. And this is, I think, an important thing for people to understand is it gets overwhelming, number one, when you look at the nation, okay? Like, what do I do? You yeah. feel so little. And my counsel to piggyback on what you're saying is, you know, you have to start off by discerning your call and recognize if you're called to the marketplace, which most people are, yeah. then how do I leverage the gospel? How do I how do I transform my workplace? How do I run my business in such a way that I impact my employees, I impact the people that are my customers? How do I do that in such a way that I, I bring the kingdom and I the kingdom principles? The kingdom so, so focus on your call, you yeah. know, because your call might not be government. Your call might, might be running a business or your call might be teaching in a school or your call might be raising children right now. What am I doing to maximize my influence in my realm yeah. and to bring the fullness of the kingdom and kingdom ideas and kingdom thought and the blessing of the kingdom into that realm? So. Don't focus on the big picture. Focus on your picture yeah. and, and everybody doing their part. And, and ultimately, what's going to change our culture is not our efforts and what we do. 
is for, for us to walk in obedience. Because when we walk in the obedience in the yeah. kingdom of God, when we listen and obey, now something supernatural is happening. Yeah. And, and, but again, I think in my own heart, I felt the Lord says we have to shift on the kingdom. For us to truly impact our culture at large, it can't be one hour a Sunday. No. It has to be Monday no. through so, Friday. Every day what we do, we commit everything we do to God's kingdom. Now our impact has grown exponentially. Yes. And, and so this is a big shift, again, even for most pastors. Yeah. Because our focus is on what am I going to preach on Sunday and how do I encourage my people. Right. But, but what we're saying is those are, those, that vision is way too small. Yeah. And it's too narrow. It's too myopic. We need a bigger vision of how do we disciple this nation. And if we've yeah. lost higher education for the most part, and we've lost the media, we've lost entertainment and the arts, um, you know, that, that's why I get a little bit frustrated. You know, when, when some of the Christian movies came out, you know, like Courageous or some of these mm -hmm. things, you know, you get these Christians that all of a sudden are now um, movie critics. And well, well, Christians always come out with cheesy movies and blah, blah, blah. You know, hey, how about this? How about somebody is trying? Yeah. Somebody's starting. <laughs> right. So, and, and those movies, by the way, I don't think are cheesy. I think they're powerful. But those were operated on shoestring budgets that came out of a local church vision which I think we should be applauding and celebrating. Absolutely. You know, anytime our churches are creating things, even though they don't have the budget and all the high tech stuff and you know, all you know, all of that, the studios, fancy studios. Right. But you know what? You have to start somewhere. And so praise the Lord for people that are creating and that are are doing things proactively out of the local church. Like we said, you know, we have a heart to, for for Living Stones to be a place where the business community can come and number one, find shelter. That you know what, you're going to be at a church that's going to push back, you're going to be at a church that's going to fight, you're going to be at a church that's going to stand for your right to lead as a believer and to bring your values into the marketplace, uh, and then provide a place where Christian leaders can come together and share ideas and dream together and support one another and pray together and ask those questions, Lord, what are you wanting us to do? And believe that the Holy Spirit has some suggestions and some answers to that question. Yeah, yeah. But the, but it's a safe place where we can come together and say, hey, I'm dealing with this or right. I'm facing this challenge and that you don't have to do it alone. But that we could begin uh, to ask these deeper questions and say, what can we do as a local church to begin chipping away at yeah. some of these you know strongholds? So, you know, this again shift the mindset even for us as pastors. Our primary job is to not to do the ministry our primary job is to equip, equip, amen. equip people, so that so that I can be so whatever I, who I'm equipping. Again, now we're not just doing ministry one or one night a week or one Friday night or Sunday morning. Now we're multiplying ministry yeah. because people are being equipped to do ministry to well, impact let's, culture Monday through let's Friday. Give, let's give an example. We have a young man who's studying uh, government. Went through our, our Roar Bible College, um, and uh, he is saying, you know, I really feel a, an interest and a call to public policy. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Well, I got in charge with the with the local Republican leadership here in town, um, got him involved, connected there. He's now serving on a variety of campaigns. Uh, he wanted to do an internship. Uh, we used our influence here as Living Stones with some national organizations uh, that provide internships for young people that are working on causes of faith and family and freedom. Uh, we write you know, letters of recommendation. We use the influence we have to take those young people that have a governmental call and to say a couple things. Number one, that call is a holy call. Mm -hmm. It's a God. It's a kingdom call. Yep. Government belongs to the Lord. And then how do we leverage our resources to get you in some practical experience? And then someday, hopefully, this guy will run for school board or for city council or for state rep or for Senate or for Congress or for president. Who yep. knows? but that the church should be able to see victories coming out of our local gathering. Like, this is what we do. We're going to raise up business leaders. We're going to raise up teachers and educators and lawyers and doctors and engineers and, and people in the public arena that have been discipled in the local church, yes. as you said, equipped in the local church with a biblical worldview so that they can apply that truth to their specific discipline. Yeah, so I think that's one of the first action step is your mindset. What is your mindset? Is your mindset a, a mindset of, I want to get to heaven as quickly as possible? Right. Or a mindset of, I want to usher in God's kingdom. God's kingdom is so beautiful. It's so powerful. It'll impact everybody. It'll touch my neighbors. It's the best way to love people. It's the yeah. best way to love my nation. It's the best way to uh, for people to prosper, for my kids to prosper, for my neighbors to prosper. Yeah. So I want to usher that. So that's a mindset shift. But now it's ownership mentality because ushering the kingdom of God does, means that you can't be a bystander. You can't just sit on a Sunday morning and 
listen to a sermon, be done. Yep. No, it means you got to get get in the game. It means you have to make sacrifices. You have to die to yourself. Now, you means you have to surrender and give yourself to God and let Him take over. I mean, yep. there's a lot of things to that. You have to be competent. You know, you, you, you can't have to work jump, hard. You yep. can't jump into these arenas with no knowledge, no background, no no. Uh, larger picture of, of what you're doing i mean you yeah. know you, you have to be you have to equip yourself you have to be excellent you have right. to grow which we're going to be talking about you know we're going to be doing a new series uh coming up in the month of uh, uh december and january that really drills into our our, our values here at living stones uh, of which uh a couple of those are things that will be very helpful in uh yeah. in what we're trying to accomplish here but you know i was just thinking we we for instance we have a marriage class mm -hmm. every week we help people strengthen marriage and family. So so that mountain of, of family, we're saying if the church isn't addressing these issues and helping people learn how to love their wives, love their husband, raise godly kids, and have success in the family, our nation's gonna fall apart, period. So, so that is something we gotta focus on. So we're taking ownership on that, but I'm just talking out loud. Yeah. Why wouldn't we have a weekly worldview class that equips people in the marketplace or a, a weekly uh, kingdom business class, kingdom government class. Hmm. I mean, there, I could just envision a whole list of areas where we should be having ongoing dialogue and discussion about how we take the wisdom of God's word and apply it to every arena of life. Yeah. Now, again, that that's <laughs> we can dream now, but sure. th there's got to be people that are raised up that can step in and actually do that. Right. But wouldn't that be great? And shouldn't the church, I'm just asking, shouldn't the church be the thought leaders in all of these areas, if Jesus Christ is the foundation of wisdom yeah. and, and the foundation of truth, uh, we should be thought leaders. And unfortunately, the church, no one even considers the church, talks to the church. In fact, most pastors, especially we saw this during this whole COVID thing, we have rolled over and hidden and died and submitted and, and stayed in our closets. And the church has, in many places, has become increasingly irrelevant uh, during this season, instead of being a voice uh, and an essential voice for the time, uh, we've got to change that. Yeah, and that's not how I want to live. No, that's not the vision statement for my life to no. be as irrelevant as possible, to be as comfortable as possible. You know, um, one of I think, and we have the same. I think at Livingstone Church, we have a DNA of impact. We want to make a difference for God's kingdom. I think people are itching to know what, where to go and what direction there is to go. That's a good place to be. We don't have all the answers. Yeah. However, we're hungry for it. Yeah. And there's no complacency, so that's good. Yeah. I think I think we got more questions than answers right now. Sure. But but those are good. That's what I'm saying. Those are good. And I guess I just want to shift here a little bit. You know. We have to seek the Lord. This all has to be driven in prayer and on our knees and obeying God. Uh, we do our part to learn, to study, to show ourselves approved. And then we need to rely on the Holy Spirit because at the end of the day, this is a supernatural battle. I mean, you could have the most airtight argument on great principles and have the data and the charts here yeah. to show you. I mean, this happened, for instance, on marriage and the family. I mean, the social science data on, on why we need a husband and a wife together in a healthy home to raise healthy kids. The social science data is off the charts on this. And yet, if you have a bias against that view mm -hmm. and a mental stronghold, Doesn't you could matter. care less. You don't, right. you, you'll ignore it. And so, and so we need a Holy Spirit engendered revival where the Holy Spirit rocks people. And I, I hate to say this, but it's the truth. Revival comes on the heels of controversy and conflict and usually societal pain and brokenness. Mm. And, and that's the only thing that wakes up the church usually is uncomfortability that comes from pain. Yeah. And I'm hoping we don't have to go there again, um, but my gut feeling is that as we're praying for revival, many times the Lord allows shakings. He allows the pain level in a culture to increase because of bad ideas and bad government and perversion. He allows that to increase because that wakes the church up. Finally, we're like, oh, we got to do something, you know, because it touches us personally. Yeah. And then God moves in mighty ways to redeem and heal and restore. And, and uh, so, so we'll see. The, the verdict's out on that. But I, I think we have, we have to, the church, well, yes, the church, the body of Jesus Christ needs to get to a place in which we care more about God's kingdom than for our own kingdom. Yeah. I think that's the number one step. It's and we don't do that by nature. Nope. Nope. And, and let me you just get say lost this. lost in our own kingdom. Yeah. Who wants to jump into some of these arenas that are basically strongholds for, 
you know, secular ideas and mm-hmm. godlessness. You know, you know you're picking a fight as soon as you jump in. There. Yep. And most of us, by nature, we don't want to fight. You know, we t- we choose the the path of least resistance. But I want to encourage. I, I, just, I barely, you know, as we're, we're kind of wrapping up our podcast today, I want to encourage us, irregardless of where this thing goes, because right now we don't know, and, and nobody knows. Uh, and there's certainly going to be some battles in front of us. But I encouraged us uh, Sunday with with a, a powerful scripture. But I, I did. Time didn't permit me to leave with a couple more scriptures. But this was one that was so good. Psalm seventy one fourteen. Uh, but as for me, I will always have hope, and I will praise you more and more. You know, that verse was all over the Internet on uh, uh, after Sunday. A lot of our people were sharing it. But as for me, so make it personal. I'm going to live, you're going to live in a place of hope. Yeah. Another verse I wanted to share that I thought was so good, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. I love this. Hold tightly. Let's not be moving back and forth, wavering to the hope that we affirm. In other words, we say it with our mouths, but that hope's going to be tested. And we've got to grab on tight to hope because the devil wants to rip hope out of your hands. And it says, here's why we do this. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. So I want to encourage us to let's stay in the word. Let's stay happy. Let's stay full of hope. Let's hold on to the promises of God. Let's pray the promises of God. Let's speak the promises of God because God's word is true and because our words, as we talked about earlier, really do shape shape reality, whether it's the mainstream media or whether it's believers declaring the word of the Lord. And then lastly, I want to remind us that uh, Romans 15, verse 13, Paul said, I pray to God, or I pray that God, the source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him, and then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. What a great picture. Um, God, the source of hope, is going to completely mm-hmm. fill us with his joy and peace as we trust. Amen. Our job is to trust. God's job is to fill. And so let me encourage you today, even though you know we, we all have major concerns, don't let those concerns translate into irrational fears and hysteria. We need to keep our confident trust in the Lord. And when you do this, the fruit of that is joy and peace. So I just want to ask you today, are you full of joy and is your heart at peace? If you're not, you've probably lost your hope and you lost your hope because you stopped trusting in the Lord. So let's be confident in the Lord. One of my favorite quotes, and I'll end with this and I'll let you have the final word today. My favorite quotes from G.K. Chesterton. He said at least five times, The faith, with a capital F, the faith, the gospel, has to all appearances gone to the dogs. And in each of these five cases, it was the dog that died. (laughs) (laughs) If I'm a gambler, you know, and you saw a lot of market fluctuations, people were trying to figure out uh, if Biden wins, what's going to happen? If Trump wins, what's going to happen? The market was doing one of these. Let me just tell you all this. If you're a gambler... Put your confidence, put your money down on the kingdom because that dog always wins, all right? No matter what the prognosticators say, Amen. the gospel Amen. always wins. And, uh, and as long as we are in alignment with the Lord and with his kingdom, his kingdom is, uh, the gates of hell will not prevail. Yeah, that was the promise you shared earlier. So yeah, his kingdom final never thoughts. Ends. His kingdom never ends, you know. The, he, the kingdom of God is always going to be expanded. What with you or without you, and that's what I, I recognize. Love that. it's, it's an ever increasing, ever increasing. So my job is not to grow the kingdom because I can't. Right. It's not my kingdom. Right. My job is to jump into it. Yes. And by one decision, by one obedience, I can step into the kingdom of God and walk in, like you said, hope, fruitfulness, joy, yeah. and the supernatural. And by one selfishness or, or one disobedience, I can walk out of the kingdom. Yes. And as I'm learning what, what the kingdom of God really is, not just on a theological level, but on a practical day-to-day level, I'm realizing, wow, how powerful God's kingdom is. It really is the supernatural. Yeah. And can you imagine if we're all doing that consistent basis, intentional about yeah. giving of ourselves, um, not living for our kingdom, for our dreams, our retirement, our financial gains, our own agenda, and live for God's kingdom every day, every single one of us, all his believers. You know, not just because I'm a pastor or whatever. Because yeah. if you're in the marketplace, you're a pastor to your, your employees. Yeah. If you're a doctor, you're a pastor to your patients. If you're a lawyer, you're a pastor to your patients, yeah. to your 
we're all full-time ministers. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. There's no full-time ministry or part-time ministry in the kingdom right. of God. We are all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Come on. And yeah. I, I love what you said. So, so you go with the expectation that, yeah. you know what, when I align with the kingdom, yeah. my influence is going to expand. My, my fruitfulness is going to expand. My profitability is going to expand. The growth of what I'm about is going to expand. Let the kingdom of God uh, drive what you do, and uh, and His kingdom wins. Amen. He's so always going to win. That's the plan. So this is good news. And in the midst of all this uncertainty, we have incredible hope. Our identity hasn't changed. God's kingdom hasn't changed. Our ultimate end has not changed. But but we do have work to do, and we want to encourage you all. This is a time for greater growth, greater intimacy, greater friendship with God. Uh, press in. Uh, this is the time to be Noah and Job and Daniel, as we shared last week, to live godly lives, lives of faithfulness. Um, and I want to encourage you this Sunday as we're really going to kind of have a message on where do we go from here? And we're going to have a lot of, of positive, powerful principles that you're going to want to pick up and begin to implement in your lives. And so let's just pray. Lord Jesus, your kingdom come. Your will be done in America, even as all kinds of uncertainty and all kinds of battles are taking place. We declare you win. We declare you are Lord. We declare that you're working behind the scenes, no matter what the outcome, for your glory and for the good of your church and for the blessings of our community. So, Father, we thank you for that reality. And Lord, our hope is rooted in you. Yes, and we praise you for that and give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What practical things regarding this podcast can we share with our, our viewers as far as uh, get, getting the word out and uh, feedback? Yeah, I mean, again, on Pastor Ron's Facebook, please share, comment, uh, share with your friends. Um, this is also going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel, yeah. um, a Livingstone's YouTube channel, so you can always find it in, in the yeah. uh, playlist, the Ron Johnson Discipleship Podcast playlist. And so. we, we love your interaction and feedback, so please comment, please share your ideas, uh, that helps us. Yeah. And let me just say too, you know, God, there's great momentum right now uh, here at Living Stones. Uh, we're seeing incredible fruit, people are hungry, the Holy Spirit is t tangibly felt. We encourage you, if you're watching this podcast, to maybe watch us online if you're not local. If you are local, I want to welcome you out this Sunday as we gather together at 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. Uh, but the Lord is moving, and there's reason for great excitement. Uh, and uh, we want to invite you to be a part of that. So again, thank you for watching today. We look forward to these times together each week. Uh, and again, we look forward to seeing you Sunday. God bless. Take care.